Today is Friday, September 3rd, 2021. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Updates on the wrongful death suit of the young man police accused of felony faint. He died in police custody. In Chicago, a third city cop has been arrested this week on allegations of excessive force. A veteran officer is caught on video shoving a flashlight between a clothed teen's buttocks. Martin. 
inmates in Arkansas jail say they took the deworming drug of her medicine to treat COVID-19 and were not told about it. In Beverly Hills, a police task force arrested 106 people, all but one were black. According to a class action lawsuit, the task force targeted black people with harassment and arrest for low level and even non-existent violations to keep them away from Rodeo Drive. The former Minnesota police officer who shot and killed Dante Wright faces a more serious charge and the other three cops in the death of George Floyd, they say, please no live streaming of our trial because some people will not testify. The South Carolina Supreme Court strikes down a city ordinance mandating masks for public school children just as the state struggles with a surge in school-related coronavirus cases. Also updates on the R. Kelly trial. A woman testified that the singer paid her $200,000 to settle a lawsuit after giving her herpes. Also, President Joe Biden blamed the surge in COVID-19 cases. The lackluster August jobs report, which saw an increase in black unemployment. Plus, in Alabama, the first African-American woman in the Birmingham School Board joins us tonight for our Education Matters segment. It is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. Folks, day 12 of the R. Kelly trial, and a woman identified as Kate uh, testified. Uh, she dated R. Kelly, and he paid her $200,000 to settle a lawsuit she brought accusing him of giving her herpes. She told jurors when they began having sex, she told him that she was worried about STDs, but he refused to use protection. On yesterday, federal prosecutors called DNA experts to take the stand. The expert, Yang Fei Wu, testified that he found semen on a blue shirt that one of the R&B stars' accusers said she saved. Earlier in the trial, uh, Geronda Pace recalled her last day at Kelly's home, saying he spit on her, slapped her, and choked her until she passed out after he flew into a rage because she texted a friend. It's going to be my panel, Terrain Bailey, attorney, uh, Michael M. Hotep, host the African History Network, Brittany Lee Lewis, political analyst. So, attorney Bailey, how you doing? We'll start with you. Um, you are defense attorney. As you look at this trial, you've seen how the prosecution is laying, laying this out. Do you believe that they are moving closer to proving the charges or... Does things like this testimony saying he gave her herpes, how does that actually relate to what he is charged with? The testimony about um, R. Kelly not listening to the woman saying she wanted to use a condom goes to the issue of consent, to, which is the whole issue in this case that of regarding trafficking and the abuse of women, that he's not listening to women and that he is abusing them. So in many states, the, when some, giving someone a sexual transmitted disease is grounds for a felony charge. So here, the prosecution is doing its job and laying the groundwork for a conviction here. What's interesting is how the defense attorneys are handling this information. Um, uh, to the folks at audio, I'm getting lots of feedback there, so I'm not quite sure whose microphone that's coming from. Um, um, when you say uh, the defense, uh, uh, speak to that. Uh, is it that they have not much to work with? Because, you, again, what seems to be consistent is that they are attacking folks saying, oh, did you cut a deal? Is that why you're testifying? When a lot of the women who are testifying, they aren't charged with anything. Well... The defense doesn't really have much to work with here because there's so many victims and so many allegations that are consistent. So the only thing that they can do is really try to attack the credibility of each of, this, each of these women and try to say that there's another motive or other incentives for why they're going after him in this way, okay. such as monetary gain. Uh, Brittany, um, what is interesting about, <laughs> about this, as we have uh, been covering this, you still have people out there 
or who are Art and R. Kelly fans. I got people who are tweeting me saying, oh, you're not telling the whole story. You need to get the transcripts of the trial. These people are lying. Uh, they are not doing a good job. That There are inconsistencies. I mean, we're, all of this, I mean, it, it, it is very interesting, again, with, with the documentaries being done, with the stories being done, with all the different things, you still have people who are saying, oh, Robert Sylvester Kelly is being railroaded. <laughs> Roland, I have to laugh. Um, these people are misogynists. To be clear, if you are caping for R. Kelly, you are a misogynist, period. Um, and, and I guess my question would be, at what point do we start loving black women? Um, when are we going to actually hold these abusers accountable? Brittany, I, Brittany, I'm, believe, getting, I'm, getting, Brittany I'm getting tweets from black women. Uh, you know what's funny is that misogyny, the same way that I say we, ha we have black, uh, excuse the language, black Uncle Toms running around, right, who have also internalized white supremacy, there are also black women who have internalized their own, th the misogyny within the, within the community, right, who are also affected by the patriarchy. And I'm sorry that that, that is happening. It is unfortunate. But the reality is we need to start loving each other. We need to love black women. And most importantly, start believing victims, right? Um, when are we going to hold these people accountable? And it really is unfortunate, Roland, because it's not just R. Kelly. We're talking about any time a black woman is is raped, she's battered, she's abused. Look at some of these comments related to Fabulous, related to Chris Brown, even related to Nas. And people are just like, no way, right? Oh, but we still want to support, we still want to listen to the unfortunate, right? And it's all fun and games until it's that person's child or that person's sister or that person's mother. And then it's, well, why is anybody supporting me and mine? And, and why, why does it always have to be the proximity to a loved one to understand that there are abusers in our community and that they need to be held accountable? Michael. You know, uh, Roland, I've been uh, covering this case uh, since day one. And this is uh, every day, man. You know, there, there's some deep. First of all, there's some details that I don't even share on my show. This is this is some sick stuff. When you when you read the testimony, um, w you know, Faith's father um, on day 10, uh, uh, the third woman who accused R. Kelly of exposing her to herpes. Her name was Faith. She testified. Her father is a pastor. He was there at the trial and he was outside of the trial. And there were our female R. Kelly supporters who were berating him, you know, and, um, you, you know, we talked about this last Friday on your show, the most disrespected woman in America or the most, dis most disrespected person in America is the black woman. And we're seeing this here a second time. We saw this in the first trial. We see this again a second time here, and uh, today, um, this woman who testified, she's the fourth woman, uh, her name, uh, they're using the name Kate, she's the fourth woman to testify in this trial to accuse, that accused R. Kelly of exposing her to herpes. And, uh, you know, brother, we have to stand up to defend African American women, but also, I, I just had a quick question for the attorney here, uh, if I could. Um, I, I just wanted to know, the, the charges are rac one count of racketeering and right. eight counts of violation of the Mann Act, which is interstate sex trafficking. And I, I just wanted to know, how is the, the how is the prosecution doing uh, presenting their case regarding the one count of racketeering? How are they doing in, in regards to that? They're, well, let me start first with the trafficking. They're doing an excellent job with the trafficking because they're showing mm -hmm. the person the plane tickets and the traveling across state yes. lines. The right here is, yes. I see them moving in that direction as aggressively, and I'm, I'm assuming that they're going to do that through other witnesses because I haven't seen as much of that from the current the witnesses that have testified thus far. I mean, we've had right. some testimony from people from R. Kelly's um, camp that have assisted mm -hmm. in arranging these meetups with the women backstage and um, assisting with introducing him to these women. But the racketeering case, from my perspective, is not as strong as the trafficking case at this point. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, um, obviously, the defense will have an opportunity to put their, uh, the, the, uh, their case on. Uh, right. This is one, <coughs> one of three, three cases he actually faces, uh, Terrain. And so... Um, do you believe that as this move forward, uh, this jury of seven men and five women uh, are going to listen to this harrowing testimony? And as you said, I mean, it's, it's very gritty. 
It's extremely, uh, when you talk about the choking, one woman said that uh, he, he, he forced her to uh, perform oral sex on him. A gun was nearby. There was a man who testified that R. Kelly performed oral sex on him. I mean, I mean, when you, I mean just day after day, uh, just extremely graphic testimony uh, and uh, that, that this jury is hearing every single day. This testimony is exhausting for a jury. Day after day, to, and each detail gets more gruesome and more detailed. And so the jury can become exhausted with these facts. So by the time the defense gets to their case, they're going to have to try something new to mitigate some of these allegations. And the only thing they can really go for is jury nullification. And jury nullification is when you say, okay, these are the facts, okay? But look at it from this point of view. These women, regardless of their age, consented to being initially involved with R. Kelly. And then they take it from there and they start showing how this may have been more consensual and part of sexual preferences more so than abuse. But that is going to be a hard sell to a jury, but you're going to have to ask the jury to set aside all their reason and all their common sense and say these women, all, all these women agree to this behavior and this treatment. Um, this is going to be, again, something we're going to continue to follow and we certainly will see. Uh, what happens next in this case, but uh, it is uh, it just very significant uh, with this level of testimony. Let's go to Minnesota, where after reviewing the case, the former Minnesota police officer who shot and killed Dante Wright, they face a more serious charge. Uh, former Brooklyn Center officer Kimberly Potter was already facing a count of second degree manslaughter. Thursday, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison added an upgraded charge of first degree manslaughter to the existing count of second degree manslaughter. The officer shot Wright, who was unarmed during the traffic stop. The incident was recorded on police body camera video on April 11th. Potter claims it was an accident, saying she thought she had a taser in her hand and not her service weapon when she pulled the trigger. Um, what do you make, uh, Terrain, what do you make uh, of, of, of the aggressiveness of A.G. Keith Ellison? Uh, obviously, uh, a huge win for them uh, with, with the conviction uh, of the former cop who killed George Floyd. This new era of prosecuting police officers after George Floyd, we're seeing something unprecedented. Officers used to mistreat defendants and just walk away with complete immunity. And after what we saw in Kentucky regarding Breonna Taylor, we're seeing attorney generals across the state, like the attorney general in Colorado in the um, McLean case, just come forward and say, you know what, enough is enough. Officers, they are charged with a duty. And then when they act outside their duty, they need to be held accountable. So this is really good for the public. This is saying we're going to hold these officers accountable. Um, again, this is what happens when you have, Brittany, uh, you have attorney general or district attorneys who are not in the pocket of police in the unions where they are examining the evidence. Absolutely. And, and we've known for a long time with all of these cases, the evidence is always damning, but it's a matter of actually doing the due diligence and prosecuting appropriately and letting our friends, uh, our friends walk away. And, and I'm glad that we're finally entering this new moment. It does seem um, like this moment is unprecedented because we know that oftentimes these police officers are not convicted, um, let alone even charged. And they're able to literally shoot first and ask questions later. Um, you know, it, it's, I feared for my life. I made a mistake. And, and that's always seemed to been enough to be enough. And, it, and it's just, it's not anymore, Roland. And I'm, and I'm glad that we are seeing these police officers being held accountable. Uh, Michael, uh, again, this we, we talk about DAs matter, AGs matter. Right. We're seeing this in the case of Minnesota. Absolutely. And we just saw this in the case of Elijah McClain as well, because yes. the Democratic elected, the Democratic governor appointed a special prosecutor who is the state's attorney general. State's attorney general came back with 32 counts against uh, three officers and two paramedics. And here, once again, this is an example of how elections have consequences and elections matter. OK, so we have to make a direct connection between protests and issues that we're protesting against and who actually resolves those issues. The uh, 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 police reform, uh, DAs, all of that, prosecuting rogue police officers, et cetera. Uh, it, the, one, the one thing that I have concerned and, and, you know, I've been I've covered a number of 
different police cases and police shootings. Um, the one thing I have a concern about is what happens when this white female police officer, if she gets on the witness stand, and if they have a jury trial, because in this state, I'm not sure if she can have a bench trial, because that's, that's a trick that they pull also, is have a bench trial with just the judge that's the juror, as opposed to a jury of 12, to take the public out of it and take the emotion out of it. What happens when she gets on the witness stand, Kim Potter, and breaks down crying and sobbing and say, I didn't mean to shoot this boy and all this stuff? That, that's, that's, that's my concern, you know? So we have to see um, how this turns out. But, uh, you know, I, I agree with the charges, but we have to see how this turns out. Uh, folks, uh, let's stay uh, in Minnesota, where attorneys for three of the other officers on trial for uh, killing George Floyd, they now uh, want to keep the trial from being broadcast and live stream. Go to my computer, please. Uh, the, re the request came from the attorneys for Thomas Lane, Jay Queen, and Tao Tao. Uh, they, um, then they, earlier, they wanted the uh, trial to be publicly broadcast. Now they're saying, now they're saying that, oh, that if this is a uh, stream, that uh, there are people who are not going to want to testify uh, if they do so. Terrain, that, that's quite interesting. Uh, that's quite interesting there uh, on that particular point uh, that, not, that by saying that, oh, if, if it's streamed, there are people, they're not going to testify. Um, really? I, they don't have a choice. A subpoena is a subpoena. It's not an invitation. So they don't... <laughs> Well, you, you, you're saying there's no party flyer, huh? No, no. You don't need RSVP. You just show up or you go to jail. And it's very simple. And so I think what's happening is that these officers and their um, defense teams are seeing how the live stream of the trial worked out in the first trial. And it didn't work out very well there for Derek Chauvin. I mean, we were able to see, and we talked about this, his, you know, his reaction to the jury and, and just how he he reacted to the testimony about the death of George Floyd. And so it's not to their benefit to have it publicly broadcast. This has nothing to do with their witnesses. Their witnesses have no say-so whether or not they come or go. So uh, this is a and, and, and you know what? I respect that. I, I respect that. You do what you have to do to protect your client. So if your client, if, if it's not looking like it's going to work out well for this to be broadcast for your client, then you try to shut that down. This is what they wrote, uh, Michael. Cameras in the Chauvin courtroom brought us the, to the dangerous pass where people are deterred from testifying for the defense because they fear the wrath of the crowd. Mm-hmm. Well, wait a second. Before Derek Chauvin was convicted, you wanted the, the trial to be broadcasted. You wanted the trial to be live streamed. Now that it didn't go the way you thought it was going to go, now you changed course. See, the question I would ask, I, the, 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 on cross-examination, I would ask the question, what changed between when you first made that statement, okay, because the evidence didn't change, basically, okay? So what changed between, between when you first made that statement, you wanted it uh, broadcasted, and all of a sudden now you don't want to broadcast it? But I, I find it interesting that they're saying this now. When you had African Americans who, who testified, OK, in the Derek Chauvin trial, it was broadcasted. When you had the case of Darnella uh, Frazier, we heard her voice, but we did not see her face. OK, you can do the same thing for these people who, who you're claiming uh, don't want to testify and have a live stream. You, we can just hear their voice. We don't have to see their face. So, uh, you know, when they, when they make changes like this, I, I just have to ask the question, OK, so what changed before when you were talking all that stuff, uh, 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 selling wolf tickets before, before the uh, a verdict? And now all of a sudden, you want to, uh, you don't want to have it live stream. Yeah, uh, it is, uh, it's quite interesting there, Brittany. Maybe it's because, oh, you're afraid <laughs> of that conviction? <laughs> <laughs> Roland, they know they're about to get chewed up, spit out, and locked up. Um, and the court of a public opinion is important. And we saw that, we've seen that with the last couple of cases. Um, they, they know what's about to happen. And that's why that, 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 Quick switch happened, right? Now now they don't want it to be public. So they know they're about to get locked up. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the transcript of what they're going to testify to is going to be made public. Right. So it's not as if they can testify right. in secret and say, well, I said, you know, he's a great guy, nobody's gonna know it. So this is simply for the defense. They they know it is not um, this is an uphill battle for them in the court of public opinion. Uh, yeah, and again, if you've already convicted uh, 
Derek Chauvin, you know they are concerned. Let's go to Georgia, where a former Georgia prosecutor is facing misconduct charges related to the killing of Ahmaud Arbery. Uh, a grand jury indicted former Brunswick Judicial Circuit District Attorney Jackie Johnson for violating her oath of office and hindering a law enforcement officer. Arbery's father says he wants everyone involved in his son's death to be held accountable. I mean, it's so grateful because, you know, everybody that had their hand on his death need to be brought to justice. Because the way he died, it just really devastated my family. I'm still struggling with it every day as a father because, you know, it's my job to protect my children. And God knows I do that. You know, I'm still hurt because all I got is pictures to look at him. And every morning I get up, I look at his pictures. I'm saddened by it. A Georgia judge is not allowing attorneys for the men accused of killing Arbery to use the slain black man's past in the upcoming trial. Superior Court Judge Timothy Wamsley said the victim's character isn't relevant or even admissible in the murder cases. Father and son Gregory and Travis McMichael and their neighbor William Bryan will go to trial in Feb this fall in the February 2020 slaying of Ahmaud Arbery, who they chased and shot after they say after seeing him running in the neighborhood. Defense attorneys say the man suspected Arbery was a burglar and tried to make a citizen's arrest. Terrain, um, this DA, uh, remember, it was three, it was, finally, it took three shots to finally get this person uh, to get to these uh, men uh, indicted. The first two DAs uh, passed on it. Here would you, you have this white DA, uh, frankly, uh, using her power to try to hinder the investigation. It's very rare to see a grand jury indict a former district attorney. We are in a new day where defense, uh, where prosecutors, police officers, everyone is being held accountable. This is a brand new day in America. And when I started as a public defender in 1998, I could have never imagined a day where a prosecutor would be charged for withholding evidence or look, be viewing a case in, against a police officer and judging it, it, it to the best interest of the police officer. And today, totally different situation. But what's interesting here is the state of Georgia got it right. Georgia's law allows for prosecutors to be prosecuted when they fail to do their job. However, in Colorado, which we're really pleased about on um, what's happening um, there with Elijah McClain, the, um, the DA in Adams County cannot be charged under the new Senate bill that the governor signed last year. So that DA is immune for anyone coming after him for refusing to prosecute those police officers and those first responders. So this is a good day in Georgia. Um, I, I dare say, uh, Brittany, um, you know, if, if you're going to sit here and protect your own, guess what? You may have to face the wrath later. Sure, sure will, Roland. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm truly happy. I mean, because you can still, you feel that hurt. You feel the hurt on that parent. I think, you know, thank God to, to all of us being out there, being in the streets. I think this speaks to the power of the people and the power of movements. Um, we're seeing this new era begin to happen because we we saw and we witnessed one of the largest social movements in history to hold police and all those associated with policing and the criminal justice system accountable. And, you know, thank God they also threw out the that evidence, uh, that, that quote on his past, right, and, and not able to use that as evidence. Because so often we see black folks face two deaths, right? The physical death, and then as, as, as the people that are mourning, they then have to mourn the quote unquote death, death, of the, death of their character, right, which we know to not be true. So I'm glad that they are, they are throwing out that evidence, and I'm also glad that they're holding this DA accountable. It's about time, and it's the right thing to do. Michael. Yeah, you know, Roland, I, I talked about this last night on my show. I was happy to hear this. And when when this whole case came about in February 2020 and uh, Brunswick uh, uh, Judicial Circuit District Attorney Jackie Johnson refused to press charges. And then we found out that Greg McMichael used to be uh, an investigator in her office. Well, I'm like, well, wait a second. Hold on. You know, I said, you know, I do know that Georgia has the largest Confederate monument in, the his in this country. But I'm like, wait a second. There should be some charges against uh, against her. So this is good to hear. And, you know, it, and the charges have said that she uh, they're alleging that she showed favor and affection to suspect Greg McMichael, but also that she failed to treat Ahmaud Arbery and his family fairly and with dignity. And, you know, I applaud, I applaud the charges and hopefully she's convicted as well. She faces, uh, I think, one to five years in prison on uh, violation of oath of, of public office. So uh, got to go, got to go.
All right, I got, I got some other police stories, but I need a break because these cops are just driving me crazy. So we're going to go to commercial break. We come back. We're going to talk about the Giles report out. Black unemployment has gone up. We'll break the numbers down next on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Yes, on the Black Star Network. Folks, if you uh, did not miss the announcement last night, uh, our OTT network launched. We are on, yes, uh, Apple phone, Android phone, Android TV, Apple TV, Roku, Samsung TV. Who am I missing? Uh, Xbox. We're on all of these platforms, uh, Amazon Fire Stick and Amazon TV. So just simply look for the Black Star Network. Just look for this right here. Uh, look for this and, of course, download it. Uh, and, of course, it's free. Uh, we're not uh, charging you a subscription. And so, uh, we again, we launched last night, and this is what happens when you are Black-owned. So not only are we live streaming on uh, YouTube, Facebook, Periscope, we also, uh, again, are broadcasting on our own OTT channel. So we want all of you uh, to download uh, this, and you can actually watch the show live right here uh, on the Black Star Network. I'll be back in a moment. I believe that people our age have lost the ability to focus the, the discipline on the art of organizing. The challenges, there's so many of them and they're complex and we need to be moving to address them. But I'm able to say, watch out Tiffany, I know this road. That is so freaking dope. <laughs> Floyd's death hopefully put another nail in the coffin of racism. You talk about awakening America, it led to a historic summer of, of protest. I hope our younger generation don't ever forget that nonviolence is soul force. Right? The I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, uh, of course, first of the month, you always have uh, the new job reports that come out, uh, and the American economy slowed abruptly in August, adding only 235,000 jobs, vastly missing economists' expectations. It's the lowest in numbers since January. President Joe Biden is urging Congress to pass his more than $4 trillion economic agenda to boost the sluggish job growth. No question the Delta variant is why today's job report isn't stronger. I know people were looking and I was hoping for a higher number. What we've seen this year is a continued growth month after month in job creation. It's not just that I've added more jobs than any first year president in, any, in the first year of any president. It's that we've added jobs in every single one of my first seven job reports, and wages are going up. Some more jobs, uh, some, uh, some, some uh, months are fewer, some months more, but always adding jobs. This is the kind of growth that makes our economy stronger and consistent progress and not uh, boom or bust. Today's report uh, fell, uh, fell far short of predictions were revised down to 728,000 from 750,000 earlier after Wednesday's ADP employment report. According to the Bureau of Labor Stats, the unemployment rate fell to 5.2% in August from 5.4%, yet black unemployment went up. Dr. Christian Brody, she joins us right now. She is an economist. Christian, how you doing? I'm well, Roland. I just want to say, first of all, congratulations on the launch of the um, new network. And secondly, I want to say not all economists. I definitely didn't see uh, the increase that, that others predicted, and I don't know why they predicted it. <laughs> so let's talk, no let, let, let's talk about this here. Uh, and so uh, give us an indication. What, 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 what were the black numbers like in terms of overall black unemployment, black men, black women, black youth? All right, so if we look from June to August, the black unemployment rate in June was 9.2%. It went down to 8.2% in July and then up to 8.8% um, in August, and that was the only rate that went up. So if we go across um, for the U.S., 5.2% in August, white 4.5%, Asian American 4.6%, Latino and Hispanic 6.4%. So again, and has historically been, the black unemployment rate was the highest 
at 8.8. .8. And so it gets more interesting if we look at um, race and um, age. All right. So if we look at white women um, in August, we had a rate of 5.2 down from 5.4. Um, or I'm sorry, 4.2 down from 4.5 there. The overall rate was 5.2. Um, men went from 4.9 in July down to 4.4%. Um, and then if we look at white teens, their, their rate went up. But now if we go over to, to black people in August, black women, the rate in July was 7.6. It went down to 7.9. It went up, I'm sorry, to 7.9. For men, it was 8.4. It went up to 9.1. And the, the, real, the real thing to look at is black teens. So their rate, I'm going to go back to June, it was 9.3%, and last month it went up to 13.3%. Theirs was the only one that went up like that. Um, and then for August, it went up to 17.9%. And so over the 13-month period between August of 2020 and August of 2021, black teens aged 16 to 19 had the highest average unemployment rate, 18.32%. So that's a group that we really need to be looking at. So what should look, these reports come out every single month uh, you, when you watch these different networks, people sort of uh, lay out, um, you know, um, you know, a, a number of uh, different things. What should we what should we learn from this and know about this? So I think one of the things that hasn't really been talked about is the percentage of people that telework throughout the pandemic. So that's something that the Bureau of Labor Statistics started tracking in, in May of 2020. And so in August, 13.4% of those employed telework due to the pandemic. Of those workers, 12.4% were white, 11.2% were black, 30.4% um, were, were Asian American. They've had very high rates of telework and 7.9% were Hispanic or Latino. And so I think that's important because black and Hispanic workers are overrepresented in customer facing jobs that are considered essential. So this is like cashiers or care workers, these customer facing jobs that cannot be done remotely and also put these workers at higher risk of getting COVID. All right, so um, what do you see uh, in terms of as we now going into the fall and into the winter? winter what are you projecting uh, for African-Americans? It's not good, um, I think. So we had the eviction moratorium, which was really good, but the Supreme Court just rejected that. And we're also getting ready to see the end of unemployment benefits. And both of those things are really going to affect black and Latino workers, particularly those who are low income. So we know that black and Latino people have lower rates of getting the vaccine. And there are a number of reasons for that, which I've discussed on your show. They're more likely to get evicted. They have higher unemployment rates. They need the benefits more. So I have no idea why economists keep thinking that the story is getting better as the Delta variant spreads. We're coming into the winter season. This is the time where people need housing, they need benefits, and they need to be able to get back to work, have child care, and have transportation. And we're just not doing enough to make sure that those things happen. Questions uh, from my panelists. Brittany, first, your question for Dr. Brody. Sure. So I'm really curious about um, where black women specifically are faring in all of this. So we know we talk a lot about obviously when white America has the cold, uh, black America has the flu. And I've obviously heard quite a bit about women specifically not being able to completely enter into the workforce because of a lot of the child um, rearing expectations and health, uh, you know, caring for children. So how do we make sense of the experiences of black women right now? Yeah. So if we if we look at black women over the 13 month period, they're um, average unemployment rate was 8.97% compared to 5.35% for, um, for white women. And so we know that black women are overrepresented in jobs like cashiers and, and these caretaking jobs that are, again, essential, but put them at risk of getting COVID, which then puts their family at risk of getting COVID. So black women, as has been the case throughout history, have been taking care of this whole country. And, and we need to take care of them now. Uh, question, Terrain, for Dr. Brody. Well, I just heard this morning that McDonald's in Oregon is starting to offer positions to youth as young as 14 years old. What impact is this economy and is this um, the job situation having on young people? And how far down are we willing to go to employ 
um, to get em more employers into workplaces. So I think it's great that McDonald's is doing that. Also, Walmart just announced that it's increasing the wage for some of its workers by a dollar an hour. But I think the important thing is thinking about how do people get to work? Do they have transportation to get to the job? Do they know that the job exists? Because how do people find out about jobs? You find out on the internet. Do they have internet at home? Are they able to apply, right? I mean, are they sharing one computer that mom is trying to use for work and the kids are trying to use for school? And, and even if so, do they, do they have enough money to be able to get to work even, right? So I think that it's great that companies are saying that they're trying to recruit workers and that they're raising their wages slightly, but I'm just not sure that it's enough in all cases. Uh, let's see here, My, uh, Michael. All right, Dr. Brody. Um, so going over this and uh, listening to the conversation here, so we saw that with African-American women, um, that we saw that uh, hiring and retail and hospitality uh, slow down uh, in this jobs report, and but we so that 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 explained a lot of the increase in unemployment for African American women. What explained the increase in unemployment for African American men? One and two, how at the same time there are millions of available jobs right now. Okay, how do we how do we navigate throughout this? All right, so I think it it partially relates to travel, right? So if you, if you think mm -hmm. about traveling. When people travel, they are the people that work at the concessions at the airport. They are the people that load the bags onto the, the airplane. They're more likely to be men than women. Um, we think about just mm. all of the, the things that go into travel. Who cleans the hotel? Who is at the front desk of the hotel? Who drives the Uber or the cab to get you to the hotel? So right. we saw people really starting to travel when things opened up. Airlines said that people could sit in that middle seat. But then the Delta variant came and people started to cancel their travel plans. And so who does that affect? Mm. It affects all the people that I just mentioned. And with the um, unemployment benefits ending, we're seeing labor force participation starting to increase. People couldn't go to work because they didn't have childcare, couldn't afford it. But now they're being forced to. They've got to figure out what to do with their children. They've got to figure out how to get to work if possible. And so with more people entering and not being able to find a job, right. even if jobs exist, do the people that are looking for a job, do their skills match the jobs that are available? Can they get to those jobs? Do they know that the jobs exist? Like that, that sort of matching doesn't happen by magic. Right. Okay, thank you. Well, um, it is certainly a whole lot to take in uh, with these job numbers. We certainly appreciate breaking down, unfortunately, uh, when you watch uh, these other networks, uh, the black focus never actually happens, uh, which is why we got to have our own. Uh, so <laughs> otherwise, we wouldn't know any of these black numbers because they definitely don't talk about it uh, on these other networks. Exactly right, Roland. So, uh, so okay, now we had our lower third that said Alabama A&M, but you got this Alcorn State shirt? Yeah, you know I went to Alcorn. I worked at Alabama A and M. I loved it. But I'm, undergrad I'm, Alcorn, grad Jackson State, got to represent. I'm just, I'm just saying. Okay, and so first of all, we got about five titles for you. Uh, and so, are you still a fellow at the Brookings uh, Metropolitan Policy Program? Yes, of course. Okay, you're doing that, but you also are at Alabama A and M, right? I'm on leave from Dillard. Yeah, see, there you go. See, I'm, I'm telling you, girl, you, you first of all, uh, you, you, you making sure you're not going to be a part of the, uh, uh, the unemployment numbers. Because uh, every time you come <laughs> on, every time you come on, you, 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 you're a different joint. I try. You know, got to make it happen, right? When I'm, I'm trying to be like you, you know, trying to make things happen. Oh, you know damn well. I don't believe in having one check. All right. Dr. Christian Brody, we certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right, folks, let me go to a break. We come back. Uh, but wait till we tell you about the craziness in Chicago where a police officer is accused of shoving his flashlight in the buttocks of a brother. Oh, but we're supposed to not hurt their feelings. I keep telling y'all, keep your foot on their neck. Otherwise, they'll do stuff like this. You're watching Roller Mark Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. White supremacy ain't just about hurting black folk. Right. You gotta deal with it. It's injustice. It's wrong. I do feel like in this generation, we've got to do more around being intentional and resolving conflict. You and process. I have always agreed. Yeah. But we agree on 
the big piece. Yeah. Our conflict is not about destruction. Conflict's going to happen. The same people who kept us in Afghanistan 18 years too long are criticizing our troops' heroic work to bring the endless war to its end. One of the largest airlifts in American history moved more than 140,000 to safety under the most difficult circumstances, a feat the press and the critics said could not be done in a situation made more dangerous by Donald Trump. The fact is, Trump's team got rolled by the Taliban in their deal. Then Trump doubled down, ordering the release of 5,000 Taliban insurgents from prison, including the commander who led the attacks that toppled the government. American veterans backed this president in getting the U.S. out of Afghanistan. We honor our sisters and brothers lost to the cause, including 13 in the mission's final days. And we respect a commander-in-chief whose own son served alongside us, who had the fortitude to do what the past three presidents did not. He ended the endless war. Hey, I'm Cupid, the maker of the Cupid Shuffle and the Wham Dance. What's going on? This is Tobias Trevelyan. And if you're ready, you are listening to and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> Another black man in Texas dies in police custody. His family files a wrongful death lawsuit against the Texarkana Police Department uh, to release Darren Boykin's 2019 arrest footage. 23-year-old Boykin was arrested because he was a suspect in a string of petty thefts in the area. He's arrested and put in the police car driven by Officer Jerrica Weave. Do you guys need me to transport him back over to your guys' police cars? Oh, we're just going to transport him. Mom! Here, Valerie. Do you just call his mom? Huh? Yeah. Here, set up. What's his name? Jason Williams. 45, 911, one out the back. Thank you, Brandon. You ran the whole way? From the nursing building. Yeah. Got your steps in, that's for sure. She's tough. Can you please knuckle my mom door right there? Oh, this is your house? Behind me. Huh? Behind no. me, brick house. No. You, no. You're going to be getting a phone call at some point downtown. Jason, you can do that then. Oh, if your family, listen to me, if your family oh, yeah, wants to come yeah. out here and pitch a fit, what, though. What are you saying the date of birth is? What's your date of birth? 8592. 8592. Okay. Let's go here. He ran all this way and then he acts like he can't. Stand up. Can't function. Stand up. Okay, sir. Stand up. You can function. It's either you're standing up or you're dragging. All right, cool. Yes, Come on. Sir, right Let's drag him. I'm trying to get up. Come Hold on. on. Let me get my hands up. You want to put him in the back seat of mine? Yeah. Or you got one over here? Can you, uh, hey, can you push the unlock button on my driver's side? Okay. Suspect two. Get in. I've seen the judge. He helped me. I can't. Get in or I'm going to pull you in. <laughs> so, are you good? During the 20 minute ride to the precinct, Boykin repeatedly tells Officer Jerrica Weaver that he could not breathe. She believed he was doing what they call felony faint. It's not until Officer Weaver arrives at the police station she realizes something is wrong. The lawsuit accuses Officers Weaver and Brent Hobbs and Sergeant William Scott of violating Boykin's civil rights by being deliberately indifferent to a medical crisis, resulting in Boykin's death. An autopsy ruled that Boykin died of natural causes and notes complications of sickle cell trait. Terrain. You know, 
when your client tells you some of the things that the officers say to them when they're being arrested, you don't want to believe them. And that, I'm just being honest about that, right? Because you want to believe that the officers are acting in the best interest of um, everyone. But what the introduction of body cameras have done for policing is shown us the indifference that they have when they are interacting with suspects who are still citizens. And they still are responsible for caring for them and making sure that they are treated appropriately. I mean, they are innocent until proven guilty. But these officers are out on the street acting as judge, jury, and executioner. And when you watch this video and you watch it all the way through, through the car ride, he's trying to tell her he can't breathe. And she doesn't even take the time to pull over to check on him. And she is so surprised when she finds out, when she when she tries to get him out the car, when she gets to the station. So the charges against her are appropriate. And like I said, this is a new day that, um, if you recall, when we first started talking about introducing body cameras um, and having officers wear them, officers were initially turning them off, uh, forgetting to, um, to have them on at all. And now there's so many states that have laws that make it illegal and act, um, and can charge officers with crimes for not having their body cameras on, because this is showing us what's really happening on the street, the complete indifference and the taunting of these individuals who are still people with rights. So this video is is incredibly upsetting, but the a right thing is happening here in Texacana. Uh, it is. Uh, it is very. Um, it is very hard uh, to, to to look at this, uh, Brittany. And and the reality is this here. Um, you know, he's dead, and the man is telling you. But now they create. Oh, felony faint. <laughs> felony faint. Roland, I mean, it's every week. Per usual, I'm I'm disgusted, I'm disappointed, but I am never surprised. This is a constant and ongoing reality with policing and dealing with those who are sworn to protect and serve. Um, and, and we know that the police, they're not serving us. They're not serving people of color. They're not serving working class folks. You know, they serve the ruling class and they protect property, not life. Um, you know, as the report said, they were deliberately indifferent to a medical crisis. And, and how many times do we we see police being deliberately indifferent. And it doesn't matter if it's someone who's been identified or classified as a criminal, or if it's someone that's a young, sweet boy and violinist like Elijah McCain. We're, we're not viewed as humans, right? Just by virtue of having black skin, we are not viewed as humans. And I always say this, but if this is what policing is, we do not need it. Um, I'm really tired, just in general, of the entire concept of policing as it has existed and evolved, because it's not fair, it's not equitable, it's classist, it's racist. And we all know that getting arrested shouldn't be a death sentence, even if someone is involved in petty theft. What, again, thinking about why someone is involved in petty theft, right, and doing what they need to do survive because they've been historically marginalized and not provided equal access. You don't stop crime by bloating police budgets and hiring more officers. You stop crime by providing access to resources and distribution of money and opportunities, right? And we know that the people who are doing the most serious of crimes <laughs> um, never see time behind bars or very rarely do anyway. You know, it is it is it is just very difficult when when we have to keep doing these stories, um, um, Michael. I mean, how hard is it? How hard is it uh, if if a prisoner is if excuse me if someone is detained if they are handcuffed and they're complaining I cannot breathe to pull over and double check? Exactly, but see that's what you do when you think that you're dealing with somebody who's a human being. Mm -hmm. That's what you do when you have. Well, that's what you do when you have somebody who, even though you suspect them of a crime, you still have compassion for their humanity. OK, here in this situation, it, it appears and I haven't read all the details on it, but on the surface, it appears they had no compassion for his humanity and just it just deemed him as as being guilty. OK, and not even respecting his humanity when he's telling them numerous times that he can't breathe. Uh, then, they, then, then they use felony faint. I haven't heard this term before, felony faint. Now, I've heard excited delirium, because that's what they tried to say that Elijah McClain died of, excited, mm -hmm. excited delirium, which is the same thing they tried to say that George Floyd died of. But all three of them were fine before police started messing with them. Now, the, the, and, and what, the, the question I have, and I haven't been able to find this, is um, they said they suspected uh, that Boykin was responsible for a series of petty thefts and sought to take him into custody. But uh, what was the probable cause? 
what was the probable cause here? I know you said he was running and things like this, but what was the probable cause to make you think he was responsible for a series of petty thefts? I'm still trying to find out that information. Uh, and that is the thing, Brittany, that again, every time one, we see one of these stories uh, and, and, and they come up, it's just, it's, it's like the same thing. And about, and about lot is uh, having police officers who treat people with basic respect and dignity. I mean, and that's the problem, Roland, that, that they don't. They they literally do not view us as human. And again, I mean, as a story, and just going back to the earliest iterations and forms of policing, it was that we weren't human, right? It was that we were property, and it was to catch us and return us back to um, the owners of the, of the property, right? And we, we truly haven't strayed very far from that. And again, we continue to see that policing is not grounded in protecting and serving. It is not grounded, it's certainly not grounded in protecting and serving black and brown people, impoverished people. It's oftentimes to protect to, to protect the ruling class and to protect property, which is why we've seen several times the National Guard being mobilized, right, when property is damaged. But we certainly don't see any type of care whatsoever when black bodies are dying in custody. It's unfortunate. And again, it causes us to continue to reexamine this call for defunding the police. All right, folks, let's go to Chicago. A Chicago police lieutenant has become the third member of the department to be arrested on felony charges in recent weeks. Mm -hmm. The Cook County State's Attorney Office alleges that uh, Lieutenant Wilfredo Roman shoved a flashlight into the buttocks of a teenager carjacking suspect in February. Roman appeared in court Thursday on aggravated battery and official misconduct charges and was released on his own recognizance. Earlier this week, two other officers were arrested in connection with another incident on similar charges. You know, Terrain, I don't recall seeing a statement from the Fraternal Order of Police <laughs> on this one. But here's the other here's the other deal. Where's the body camera footage? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Here's the body cam footage. Because if if you read the story, the officer's attorney says it was a spanking. Come on, this was just a spanking. First of all, I why is the cop spanking somebody? Hold on, I'm sorry, hold up. But, and, hold and, on, and hold up. If it's a <laughs> if it's a spanking, that's called assault. That is called an assault. But what is incredible to me, it goes back to what Brittany was saying, they don't see us as humans. Black and brown skin as being human. And so they just, they're gonna spank you like a child. If you're, uh, if you're a young man, they're going to just stick a baton in your rear and say, oh, it's okay because he had a coat on. There's no justification, but th that's an assault. Entering someone's rectum, whether it is an attempted, um, um, entry or it's an actual entry that is assault and it's a sexual assault. That's what we haven't gotten to yet. And they're trying to soft shoe it, but there was no rhyme and no reason. And I'm wondering where is the body cam footage? What is the justification for doing this? Because nothing about this alleged carjacking suspect indicates that he needed to be searched in his rectum with a flashlight. Shades of so. Abner Luima, Michael. Absolutely. And, you know, yeah. uh, reading the story here, it says the incident was captured on the officer's body camera. Um, and so I want to know where the body camera footage is since it was captured. But then the attorney, th then the uh, officer's lawyer says that there was no injury to the teen as he was clothed and wearing a coat during the alleged incident. But still, it's like um, you don't have to actually steal something out of somebody's house just breaking into the house is a crime. You don't actually have to, like, steal something out of the house. So, you know, he, this officer needs to be held accountable. I want to see the, uh, I wanna see the uh, statement from the Fraternal Order of Police. I know they're going to put one out eventually. Uh, so, uh, you know, this, this is a crazy case, man, out of Chicago. But uh, this is an example why these officers have to be held accountable. And uh, they, they need to release this body camera footage as well. Um, so this is, a, this is another crazy story, man. But at, at, at the same time, um, with these various cases taking place, um, people who want, at the same time, many of us are going to have to apply to these, apply to these police departments and be the type of officers that we want to see as well. As they weed out people like this, as they weed out these white supremacist officers, things like this, Many of us are going to have to apply to these departments and be the type of police officers who serve and protect that, that we want to see also. 
Well, it, it is uh, absolutely crazy uh, when you see these stories. In California, the Beverly Hills Police Department is hit with a lawsuit claiming its officers arrest black people disproportionately. The complaint centers on the police department's uh, Operation Safe Streets initiative. The suit claims that between March 2020 and July 2021, the task force made 106 arrests, 105 of them black. Beverly Hills Police Department issued a statement which, uh, that says the following. The, the, the women and men of BHPD take an oath to protect human life and enforce the law, regardless of race. Any violation of this pledge is contrary to the values of this department. We take all concerns regarding the conduct of our officers very seriously. That's it. I mean, I'm just saying, Police Chief <laughs> Dominic Rivetti of Terrain, 106 people arrested, 105 black. Boy, I don't know if you are. That, that, I mean, that, 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 that's, a hell of a, that's a hell of a ratio. <laughs> so, if you recall, in 1992, um, at the start of the riots in Los Angeles, the officers didn't swarm to South Central, where um, the majority of the, um, of the destruction and the violence was happening against people in our community. They swarmed to the west side of Los Angeles, and they pretty much laid a boundary protecting Beverly Hills and that west side of Los Angeles. And they wouldn't let people cross over into there because they wanted to protect those stores and protect that property. The same thing is happening here. They see people of color and they assume that we can't afford to be there. They assume that we're there to commit crimes. And they have these task force out there that have these alleged probable cause for stop stopping people and these petty offenses when there are people committing real crimes. And it's just outrageous. And so it's, um, it goes back to that point about officers being there to protect and to serve. Who are there to protect? Who are they there to protect and to serve? And it doesn't feel like it's us. And I've said repeatedly that this is going to continue until we require that police officers live in the communities that they serve. Mm -hmm. Because as long as they continue to come into our communities and police us, then it's as if they're at war with our community. And that's what's happening across the nation. Um, Brittany. I just need, I need an explanation. Cause that, that wasn't it. <laughs> like that, that really was not it. And I, and I think this goes back to the comment that I always make when we talk about policing um, and just echoing the comments earlier. This is about protecting property and protecting the white and wealthy. It's never been about protecting. They are not interested in protecting black and brown community members. We know that in inner city communities, it takes the police three times longer to arrive. It is not about protecting us. It is not about protecting the working class. They care about protecting property and the white and the wealthy. It's the policing. Literally, when we think about Rodeo Drive, it's the policing of what they believe should be a whites only area. And we may have removed the signs that say white only, um, but quite frankly, we know that there are certain spaces that they solely do not want us. There's no other way to explain this. Clearly, they can't even begin to explain it, right? The statement that they put out doesn't make any sense and doesn't explain why this would happen because it's not explainable. And I wonder at what point we are really going to continue to consider policing, you know, as it exists, because it is not for us. Yeah, uh, listen to that statement. I'm sitting there going, really? That that's uh, that that that's the best y'all can do, Michael. That, that that's <laughs> when you know you've been had. Right. They, they can't say anything else <laughs> without incriminating themselves. So this so they put out that blanket statement, okay? And they just hope this case blows over. But you got you got Benjamin Crump and uh, uh, Attorney Bradley Gage who filed this class action lawsuit, and. What's interesting is uh, uh, Attorney Gage told the Washington Post that two percent of the residents of Beverly Hills are black, but almost 100 percent of the rest are black. That's a that's a pretty clear indication something's wrong. So they can't defend this. 105 out of 106. OK, but th so this goes to implicit bias. This goes to uh, uh, a racial profiling probably as well. But the, the attorney here on the panel, Attorney Terrain, hit on something that I talked about in the previous segment. And we've talked about this before. Uh, police have to live in the communities that they police. They have to come from those communities. Because when, when, when you do that, and this is why I said, at the end of the day, many of us are going to have to apply to the police department and become the type of officers that we want to see and who serve and protect, who come from those communities, who are their protected communities, not come from outside, who are there to occupy the community and see those people as subhuman. 
OK, so, you know, I, I'm glad this lawsuit is being filed. And this is a number of significant lawsuits that uh, Benjamin Crump has filed in the past couple of months, one against uh, Johnson & Johnson dealing with baby powder um, and uh, them targeting African-American women, marketing um, uh, the Johnson baby powder to African-American women after it was um, linked to uh, uh, cancer. Uh, and then uh, there's, a, there's another one, uh, significant one he just filed as well. I, I forgot the other one also. But, you know, this is, this is uh, good news, but um, this is why you have to have uh, police reform as well. Make them pay. Make them pay. All right, y'all. Uh, going to break. We come back. We're going to talk COVID. Yeah, it's still a significant impact all across this country. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. So a lot of y'all always asking me about terms some of the pocket squares that I wear. Now, I don't know. Robert don't have one on. Nope. Now, I don't particularly like the white pocket squares. I don't like even the silk ones. And so I was reading GQ magazine a number of years ago, and I saw uh, this guy who had this, this pocket square here, and it looks like a flower. Uh, this is called a shibori pocket square. This is how the Japanese manipulate the fabric to create this sort of flower effect. So I'm going to take it out and then place it in my hand so you see what it looks like. And I said, man, this is pretty cool. And so I tracked down, the. it took me a year to find a company that did it. Uh, and so uh, they make these about 47 different colors. And so I love them because, again, as men, we don't have many accessories to wear. So we don't have many, many options. Uh, and so this is really a pretty cool uh, pocket square. And what I love about this here is you saw uh, when it's uh, in, in the pocket, you know, it gives you that flower effect like that but if I wanted to also unlike other because if I flip it and turn it over it actually gives me a different type of texture and so therefore it gives me a different look so there you go so uh, if you actually want to uh, get one of these shibori pocket squares we have them in 47 different colors all you got to do is go to rollingthismartin.com forward slash pocket squares so it's rollingthismartin.com forward slash pocket squares. All you got to do is go to my website uh, and you can actually uh, get this. Now, for those of you who are members of our Bring the Funk fan club, there's a discount for you to get our pocket squares. That's why you also got to be a part of our Bring the Funk fan club. Uh, and so that's what we want you to do. And so it's pretty cool. So if you want to jazz your look up, you can do that. In addition, uh, y'all see me with some of the feather pocket squares. My sister who's a designer. She actually makes these. They're all custom made. So when you also go to the website, you can also order one of the customized uh, feather pocket squares uh, right there at rollingsmartin.com forward slash pocket squares. So please do so. And of course, uh, it goes to support the show. And again, if you're a Bring the Funk fan club member, you get a discount. This is why you should join the fan club. I'm Bill Duke. This is Diala Riddle, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Stay woke. August was a deadly month for those battling COVID, folks. Last month saw 4.22 million new reported cases and 26,805 Americans dead from the virus. The combination of the Delta variant and the unvaccinated is causing numbers to skyrocket. Presently, there are 40.5 million reported cases and 662,000 people who have died. These states have the highest reported number of cases. Alabama, Florida, Hawaii, Louisiana, Mississippi, Oregon, Washington, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Florida reported 4,900 deaths in August, the highest ever for the state. While cases are rising in Florida, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, he's issued an order of fining $5,000 to any entity requiring vaccination proof. Florida has 3.2 million reported cases and a total of 44,000 people have actually died. I, I, I don't... It, it, it's, is that what I don't understand, Brittany, is how stupid these people are. I mean, you see the numbers, but it, it, I mean, they are so hell bent on appealing to this rabid minority of nutcases who are MAGA supporters. It, it, it's it's wild, Roland. Um, and it's unfortunate, again, I mean, this is the party, um, and this is a governor who continues to put politics 
over people, literally, and some of his own constituents, which is wild to me, right? Um, and like you mentioned, we know that, that this is happening because he wants to appeal to the MAGA base, and he's ultimately motivated by running for president in 2024. Um, but what I think is really important here is that he needs to get reelected as governor in 2022 first. Um, and from the last thing that I've seen, his poll numbers are significantly down. They were down after he kept trying to defund the schools, which was, you know, a wildly unpopular concept. So, you know, it's just interesting to watch him kind of, at first he was backtracking in the way that he was trying to defund the schools, and now he doesn't want to have vaccination cards going. And and, and it's truly mind-blowing, again, because this is all about politics and not anything to do with the health of, of the people that he is he is supposed to be serving. It's absolutely nuts. Um, Duran, a Florida chiropractor signs over 500 mass exemptions for students. Yeah, a chiropractor. A chiropractor. Sarasota so County School District issued a mask mandate enforcing students to wear a mask unless they have a medical, physical, or psychological reason. Well, Dan Bush, a chiropractor in Venice, Florida, signed nearly 13 of the exemption forms in the district. After the increase in exemption forms, the superintendent of Sarasota County Schools issued an update stating only medical doctors, osteopathic physicians, licensed, or advanced registered nurses, nurse practitioners can authorize exemptions. Florida has some of the highest COVID cases, as we said, uh, in the nation. R r r really? A, a, a chiropractor? Terrain, go ahead. I, I, I... So this is where it gets complicated with that school district because they allow chiropractors to complete medical examinations of students to even enroll in school. So you can't ride two horses with one butt on that one. So either you're going to accept the chiropractor for their medical evaluations or you're not. So they're going to have to do something a little bit more creative. I don't think that this is going to stand because I, as I read the article and I did some research, it looks like they're trying to have those families go back and get new forms completed by um, doctors and by nurses that um, they consider medical providers. But under the state statute, chiropractors are in that category as well. So but it's ridiculous that yeah. people can just go pick up a form. It's, and it's the doctor just, evaluated them. Just, so it's, it's a clear circum, it's, they're clearly circumventing the rule. A chiropractor. A chiropractor. <sighs> Let's go to South Carolina. With South Carolina. <laughs> chiropractors. Yeah, very good friends for chiropractors. Yeah, yeah, chiropractors. Uh, yeah but, the, but, they, but they damn sure <laughs> know medical doctors. Uh, exactly. uh, trust exactly. me, uh, if I got an allergy problem, I'm not going to a chiropractor. I'm going to go to an allergy doctor. I'm just saying. All right, Michael, South Carolina Supreme Court bans Columbia's public school mask mandate. In August, Columbia Mayor Steve Benjamin announced the mandate to protect school-aged children who are not eligible for the vaccine. Yesterday, the state's highest court unanimously voted against the measure, stating the mandate violates state law restricting masks in schools. <laughs> there are 4,076 <laughs> reported cases among students and 398 reported cases among staff in South Carolina. Sure, South Carolina Governor Henry McMaster tweeted this response to the court's decision. The South Carolina Supreme Court has come to a sound conclusion based on the rule of law. A parent's right to decide what's best for their child is now definitively protected by state law. I would again encourage anyone eligible to receive the vaccine to get vaccinated. <laughs> you know, uh, so it, it's a couple things here, Roland. First of all, South Carolina was the first state to secede from the union, okay? And South Carolina is where the Civil War started. You see the dumbest cases in the South, these former Confederate states who are anti-government until they need help from the federal government. They're anti-federal government until they need help from the federal government. Till a hurricane hits, or there's some type of national disaster. Or their budget. Then, or their budget, okay. Then, then, they, then they need help from the federal government. Um, when, when, when it's the law, I, I don't know what year that law was made um, when they said it's uh, uh, children can't wear masks in schools, okay. What type of mask are you talking about? What was taking place? But uh, at the same time, they need to pass an emergency law because what's going to happen is that COVID is going to spread through the, these schools in South Carolina. We already saw in uh, uh, Mississippi thousands of uh, the last last report I saw was about 20,000 students had to be sent home because of possible exposure to COVID. They had to be sent home to quarantine. That's in Mississippi. We see it in Atl uh, Metro Atlanta, okay, Met Metropolitan Atlanta. We're going to see it in South Carolina as well. So, um, this is uh, another example of in these southern 
for these former Confederate states, them not wanting to protect their constituents, and it's going to really hurt them in the 2022 midterm elections because it's going to be less of their supporters alive. It's going to be less of their supporters alive. But this this is a crazy case right here. And, and the, lastly, um, they, they're talking about get get uh, vaccines, right? Well, children under 12 are not authorized for the vaccine. Well, also, keep in mind, this is the same governor who said he would not allow President Joe Biden to send people door to door to encourage folks to get vaccines. I, I, I just I'm, I, I just can't deal with stuck stupid. on stupid. Can't stuck deal with stupid. stupid. I can't deal with stupid. <laughs> All right, y'all. Speaking of stupid, let's go to Arkansas, where inmates claim they were unknowingly given the anti-parasitic drug uh, mermectin to for COVID infections. Now the inmates, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I, ivermectin. Sorry, uh, I, ivermectin. My sorry. The inmates believe they were used as guinea pigs to see how the drug worked on humans. They say officials did not disclose what medications they would be taking. Now jail officials say the inmates were aware, and, iver, and ivermectin administered voluntarily. First of all, y'all, what is ivermectin? Ivermectin. I'm sorry. It's an anti-parasitic agent used in small doses to treat and prevent parasite infestations in humans like, oh, you know, head lice, scabs, mites, liver blindness. Mm-hmm. Got it. Y'all actually buying that? Uh, the drug is commonly used in horses and cows for parasite infections like heartworms. Yeah. Animal, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, I ain't buying that one, Terrain. Uh, oh, yeah. no, they knew. Hey, Come on now, come on. In fact, the doctor was administering it. He ain't, you know he ain't tell nobody. What's interesting is that the company that the prison, is, that, that the jail was relying on, um, there, there's a financial incentive here. The first time I heard about this drug was when my I, I, I used to own a horse and, and, and we needed to um, use that medication for my animal, but not for humans. And when you, Arkansas is one of the states that has a prisoner's bill of rights and has a, an inmate handbook so that the inmates and their rights are outlined for them and they have the right to be told what they're given. This is truly very reminiscent of the Tuskegee experiment where you give someone something, you say, okay, let's see what's happening. But according to... Um, the officials there, they said they've been using this drug to treat COVID in their jail since 2020. And we're just now learning about it. So I know the ACLU is looking into that to see how many prisoners have been, how many inmates have been given that drug and whether or not they were fully informed about what it was and fully gave their consent. But this is ridiculous. I mean, everyone from top to bottom that has any type of... Um, credibility is saying, do not use this drug. This is akin to giving someone bleach. For um, COVID, I mean, the stupidity level with COVID is is beyond belief here. Brittany, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's unfortunate. For, I mean, it, it's as if these inmates, you know, are are not humans, right? It, it's as soon as you get tied up in the criminal justice system, your humanity is completely removed, and it does seem reminiscent of the Tuskegee experiment. But it's also reminiscent of just in general America's history on testing on those that they deem as less than human. I mean, our current, um, you know, several things within our medical system exist today because of tests put on people that were deemed less than human. Um, I, I wish I could say I'm surprised they got a great lawsuit on their case on, on their hands. Uh, yeah, I think so, Michael. Yeah, it, it sounds like a lawsuit, but it, uh, also, you know, um, the FDA uh, dealing with ivermectin says that an overdose of ivermectin can lead to seizures, comas, and death. Um, it, it, well, that's the CDC that said that. So I wonder, in treating this, uh, using this in the jail, and without notifying the inmates that they were using this, uh, did anybody die? Did anybody go into a coma? Were there any seizures from this? Uh, you know, w w what happened when you gave it to? Uh, to, uh, uh, to, to my understanding, uh, no. But bomb, but but thank goodness. Yeah. Thank yeah, goodness. Thank, yeah. So you know, this is um, you know, this is a there's a history. We've talked about this before on this show. There's a history of experiments being done on African Americans, whether yep. it's in the military whether it's in the military, whether it's going back during slavery with J. Marion Sims, who was known as the father of modern, modern gynecology and the experiments okay. he did on enslaved African women without anesthesia. So uh, this is this is a troubling case, man. So, you know, the people need to be held accountable.
Absolutely. All right, folks, real quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk education matters. That's right. Uh, sister, she wins the uh, school board seat in Birmingham. That's a city they are not too particularly pleased with charter schools. Yeah, but she beat an incumbent. We'll talk about education in the Black Belt in Alabama next on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. When you study the music, yeah. you get black history by default. And so no, no other craft could carry as many words as rap music. I try to intertwine that and make that create the whatever I'm supposed to send out to the universe. A rapper, it, you know, for the longest period of time had gone through phases. I love the word. I hate, I hate what it's become, you know, and in, in to this generation, the way they visualize it. It's narrative kind of like has gotten away and spun away from, I guess, the ascension of black people. have always been essential. Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. how are you going to pay us like that? And it's not just the, the salary. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a whole number of issues that have to support us as women. Yeah. But that's what we deserve. Mm -hmm. That we shouldn't have to beg anybody for that. And I think that we are trying to do our best as a generation to honor the fact that we didn't come here alone and we didn't come here by accident. I always say every generation has to define for itself yeah. what it means to move the needle forward. Mm -hmm. Everybody, it's your man for Ed Hammond. I'm Dion Cole, you're watching. Roland it. Martin, unfiltered. Stay woke. Folks, uh, I make no bones about my support of charter schools. In fact, I support any uh, education effort that educates our children. Y'all know where I stand. I'm down with charter schools, homeschool, online school, technical schools, magnet schools, private school, you name it. It does not matter to me as long as our kids are getting a shot at a future. A few years ago, I was in Birmingham uh, and actually Montgomery uh, as well, talking about the importance of charter schools shortly after uh, the law was changed in that state. Well, in August in Birmingham, my next guest defeated uh, a city school board incumbent uh, with regards to uh, being on uh, the school board. Now, when we talk about that again, because y'all have heard me talk about this on this show on many occasions, uh, the importance of when we run for school boards. A lot of people don't want to do that, and a lot of folks then wonder, how do we actually change things? So when you actually run and you win, you get to impact public policy. A lot of people don't realize that uh, school board races, not a lot of folks vote. Well, uh, folks did vote in this race, so joining us right now uh, is uh, Nianti Williams. Uh, she won with 56% of the vote, vote uh, for District 2 there in Birmingham. What's happening? What's up? We did it, Joe. <laughs> so uh, you worked uh, You worked with Dr. Howard Fuller uh, and uh, Bayo, uh, Black Alliance for Education Options. Uh, you uh, were very much involved there uh, in efforts to expand school choice, parental choice uh, in Alabama. Birmingham, you had a lot of folks who were saying no, 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 no. Sounds to me like uh, folks bought your message about uh, how to think differently about educating our children in Birmingham. Oh, yeah. Yeah, most definitely. You know what, Roland? We just went out with a platform that was very strategic and intentional. Uh, my platform was parents, policy, and partnerships. Um, we were very consistent and concise on the messaging. It was clear our current school board is reporting that our students are two and three grade levels behind 
And families know that it's absolutely unacceptable and we could not continue to do the same thing that we've been doing in years past. So, um, you know, they, they not only bought into what we were talking about, but they knew what needed to be done. So I'm grateful that they showed up at the polls. And like I said, you know, we did it, Joe. So not only did Birmingham City Schools in District 2 win, but the entire city of Birmingham won on August the 24th. You said two and three grade levels behind? Yes, yes. And this is pre-COVID. This is pre-COVID. So now so the question is, um, you laid the message out, you know, what do you hope uh, to change and impact in Birmingham? So, so my primary goal is increasing parental engagement and involvement. You know, we started that with Bayo some years ago, and I really feel like there's not enough transparency with parents from the district level about exactly where and how children are performing. Um, recently, over the summer months, we had uh, 2,700, 30, 3,700 students participate in the summer enrichment programs, but we have 23,000 students in Birmingham City Schools. So if you don't get the whole number, that sounds like a lot of students participated, but not enough. And so what parents are doing is they're looking at report cards when they come home. They see that their students are making either A through F grades. The students are being passed along, but they do not understand exactly where this places them academically in terms of being college and or career ready. And so the first thing we have to do is sit down and have what I intend to call huddles. I'm a sports person and be extremely transparent with parents to let them know where their children are performing. Um, you know, and from a policy standpoint, you know, letting our, our school leaders know we have two laws, obviously the charter school legislation that was passed in 2015, but in 2013, we passed the Alabama Accountability Act that gives flexibility and autonomy to current school leaders to, um, to operate their schools based on how their schools and their community need it. And so, I mean, Birmingham won by having someone like myself and others being elected because we know policy and we can help now implement policy that can close this academic gap. I met you going to Birmingham and Montgomery. I forgot I also went to Selma. And I remember, and, and I think you were there in Selma as well. I remember the conversation where there was a there was a sister, and in fact, I, I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go pull that video up. And I'm going to make sure that we put it on Black Star Network so people can actually see what we talked about. There was a sister who was the first Black female athletic director at Division One A school who was on one of the panels, and she said, "This is what she said. She said that your score, your student scores and grades are so poor in Selma." that I would not send my scouts to even recruit your athletes. Because they, well, wouldn't, they, would, because they would not be able to make the grade to qualify uh, for, for uh, NCAA. Yeah, and, and you know, that's interesting that you bring up sports because in addition to working with Bayo, what really turned on the lights for me, um, I referee women's college basketball division one. And I started out on, of course, the middle school, high school level, and I grew to division two, three, and one. And as a former student athlete, I'm seeing these great athletes in high school, but I'm not seeing these students in college. And so when I started to do the research, that's where I too learned that our students are not meeting the grade level, the requirements. They, they couldn't make the ACT score. They're not, you know, back then we had what was called an exit exam that was based on an eighth grade level that students did not take until their 10th grade year in high school with six opportunities, um, twice sophomore, junior, and senior. And these students could not pass the exit exam. And so at this point, uh, the system decided, the state decided that they would remove the exit exam because so many children were actually not getting to graduate. And so parents were in uproar and, again, not understanding why their, their child was not able to graduate. And it was based on an exit exam. So we removed the exit exam. And now all we require is that students take the ACT. Not have a specific score, but just take the ACT. And so what we've created is a system of perpetual poverty because we're at home saying go to college, go to college, and students enroll, but they're starting out in remedial courses. And I'm an HBCU grad, so, you know, we have welcoming arms. We're receiving students. But where you're in college, professors are prepared to deal with college 
ready students, where in fact they're dealing with eighth graders and ninth graders because this is the grade level that they are inheriting students on. And it's unfair. And so someone has to sound the alarm to say enough is enough. And so Birmingham, they, they made it loud and clear on August the 24th. Uh, let's go to my panel for questions. Uh, I will start with Brittany. Well, first off, congratulations. <laughs> uh, congratulations. Uh, but I, I do have a question. So um, charter schools, we know, were initially created to be innovative. And I, too, absolutely believe um, that schools should not be a one-size-fit-all. Um, but I'm also someone who has worked in a failing charter school. Um, so we've seen, you know, for example, the charter school that I was working in was a charter school where we saw people with really great intentions, but they had absolutely no background in education. And essentially, in that flexibility and autonomy that they had with completely no real oversight, the school essentially ended up being an experiment or, um, you know, I would say about five different grade levels, and the school ended up closing, and a lot of those kids actually ended up going backwards. So as someone who is a proponent of charter schools, my question is, how do you address allowing students to be, you know, allowing these schools to be, quote, unquote, innovative, um, but also making sure that they are still in that innovation, hitting those markers and allowing those students to be successful and ready for college? So, so Alabama law, like many of the other states, we were the 43rd state to pass charter school legislation. So we had 42 other states to look at. Um, when you look at the national uh, statistics, they're telling us that our charter school law is the best law, um, probably because we are the last state to institute the law. But when we talk about the level of accountability, the biggest thing is making certain that we only bring quality schools or allow quality schools to come to the state of Alabama. Um, the alternative has been 67 schools on the failing schools list in the state of Alabama, and all it is is a list. And so when parents don't have a choice, they don't have an option, and so they have to send those children to those schools, you know, we have to have some other alternatives. While I am a proponent of charters and I do support it, I actually help write the charter school legislation for Alabama, I do not think that is the law that is going to help us close the academic gap. I think it is the Alabama Accountability Act that gives the autonomy and flexibility to our current schools and our current school leaders to, to do what they need to do. When, when we're in conversation with our current leaders, they are talking about we know what we need. We know, you know, we know what resources need to be made available to us. But the truth of the matter is we did not have a strong board. We did not have a board that was willing to be confident enough to make the decisions and be unapologetic about it. Um, you know, there's a mass exodus leaving the city of Birmingham and Birmingham City Schools. And so in order for us to be in sync, we we have to do something. So, um, you know, I, I think that holding that high level of accountability for charters is extremely important, but we have to hold that high level of accountability for our traditional public school system as well. And here's my whole deal. If, uh, is it like, I don't believe in having janky charter schools. If they ain't doing the job, shut their asses down. But I believe the exact right. same thing with traditional schools. Again, see, I, I, I think that, that for me, Michael, is the problem whenever mm -hmm. we have this conversation. I, I ain't down for no failure. And, and one, right. of, one of the things that I've tried to do is I've traveled the country, and, and Neonte was there. This is exactly what I said. I said, we need to be ensuring, uh, and you know this from some of the jacked up ass schools in Detroit. We need to be insured. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm just, well, I said, right. we need to be, right. and also the jacked up efforts by Betsy DeVos and others when it came to mm -hmm. charters. This is what I have preached literally in Selma, in Montgomery, in Birmingham, Atlanta, New Orleans, Chicago, Memphis, Philadelphia, uh, in Colorado, I've, all around the country. I've said, we need to be insuring that when a charter school, before a charter school opens, before they open, sound board, sound management, sound curriculum, and all of that. I said properly vet them so they are set up for success the day they open as opposed right. to these fly-by-night con artists who are trying to make a quick buck. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, and we, we, we've seen a lot of that here in Detroit also <laughs> with charter schools. Some successful, some... Hell, and yeah, but you, but you see some con artists with traditional schools. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, folks who are in prison right now for embezzling millions of dollars, but go ahead. 
Right. Well, well, criminals usually go to where the money is. So, you know, I, I agree with that. It's on both sides. It's on both sides. And, 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 and clueless Betsy DeVos was from the state of Michigan as well. OK, uh, just for people who don't know that, know that we knew about her long before she became secretary of miseducation under Trump. But um, for Neonte Williams, uh, one, congratulations on your win. Two, I'm sure your soars at Delta Sigma Theta, Delta Sigma Theta are, are proud of you. Uh, but the question I had is, with all the challenges that are, are taking place in the state of Alabama as far as education, we know they have one of the lowest, um, they, they um, one of the lowest, they, they rate uh, low when it comes to educational attainment as well in, in the nation. Uh, for this school year, for this school year, what is it that you want to see implemented to try to start turning things around? We know we're not going to solve all the problems in one school year, but for this particular school year, what do you want to see implemented to, to start making progress and in, in, in reversing these trends that we're talking about? Yes, I, you know, it goes back to me for to parents. Like, I, I think that that is the large... I've been a parent advocate for a very long time, and it's mm -hmm. like too often things have been done for us and not with us. And so when I say right. us, I'm speaking about the community and those that are most impacted by it. And so we have got to bring parents on board. That's the only way that we can... I think what it would take four years to do, we can do in two years if we are honest with our parents, if we are intentional and create opportunities. You know, we have leaders that will say, well, we want parents to come to the school. We want parents to be involved. Parents show up, and then there's the mean secretary saying, can I help you? Looking over the frame mm. of her lenses. You know, right. not really... Be there and transparent. And so I, I really, I just think, you know, without a doubt, and I'll tell you the other thing that, that made me say we've got to do something different was the response to um, what happened with COVID. You know, last year, of course, no one was prepared. No one was prepared for a pandemic. But I felt like from an educational standpoint, we reacted as opposed to responding. We should have already had partnerships with people in the community, from our faith-based community to the business community. They have, you know, beautiful emphasis. They have facilities. We should have created safe spaces. We should have put school buses in neighborhoods, took out every other seat, created hot spots, because there are a lot of grandparents and uh, great-grandparents that are rearing children today. Uh, a lot of the parents who are, are frontline workers, they work in the restaurants, they work in the hospitals, the hotels, the places that our, our state leaders deemed as, uh, you know, places of necessity. And so, you know, we, we did not do a good job. And so the biggest thing is letting parents know that they matter. And, I, and for people who aren't typically involved in the grassroots work and understand right. the importance of parental engagement, they minimize that a lot. And, and that's part of the problem. We don't respect the voices of those households that those children are coming from. And then the other thing is, you know, these parents are a product of this system that we're trying to fix. Right. So know how things are. So we can't pull wool over their eyes. Terrain. Okay, thank you. Question for Deontay. Congratulations. This win is huge. This is so huge. Birmingham, Alabama is 70, over 70 percent African-American, over 70 percent black. So looking at that number, this is largely important to our community. So for those who aren't parents, but who are interested in helping um, close the achievement gap in Birmingham, what, how do you plan to get them involved? So, great question. Um, one of the things, again, for me, it was parents, policy, partnerships, the partnership piece. I ran during during the canvassing, the door knocking, the phone banking, um, you know, thousands of folks who, who talked about wanting to be a support of Birmingham City Schools, those that are professionals, retired professionals. I even met folks who were educators that retired early because they wanted to do something different. They were kind of forced out, didn't really like how things were working, but um, create those opportunities for those folks to come back. I know in District 2, we only have elementary and middle schools. Um, and even going back to, to Michael's question, one of the things that I think we need to do is talk about equity on a very serious level. We have what we call academies in our school system here, but the academies are um, career opportunities, but they're only at specific schools. In terms of equity, we need to have those academies available to every single student that is within the high school system. So if it's um, welding, if it's cosmetology, if it's culinary arts, um, and those are some of the things that they offer through the academy, it's only in certain areas. And so if a student is not in that area, 
then or doesn't live in that community, they're unable to attend those schools. We have a lot of empty buildings here. So, you know, my goal is that we can work together as a board to create centralized locations where those students can be bused into those sites. And um, from an equity standpoint, that every student that wants to participate can participate. Um, and the other thing is, um, you know, starting those academy at the middle school level. We have such a high dropout rate. Um, I think if we can early expose to college and career paths, um, starting with those academies at the middle school, then the students will be more likely to stay in school and finish and enter into a career path of their choice. But again, allowing those those folks to come back to the community, come back into the schools, um, create partnerships, and that's a, that's that's it. I don't, you know, just. Parents policy partnerships. Um, I have a ton of things, and I know it's going to take the other eight board members for us to to work together as well as the superintendent. But um, but there's a different atmosphere here in Birmingham. This this was indeed historic. We've never had an African American female represent this district in the history of Birmingham City Schools. Um, where 97 percent of the students in Birmingham City Schools are African American, and so that in itself is 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 incredibly uh, necessary for these young children to see someone that looks like them, that understand and speak the language that they speak. I will be in Birmingham next month for the Magic City Classic, uh, and so look forward uh, to seeing you there. And so. Uh, also look forward to hearing some uh, great things what's happening there because again I've got a lot of black folks in Birmingham a lot of black folks in the black belt of Alabama and education is vitally important and we cannot we cannot be in a situation uh, where we're making excuses for our kids not getting education and let me say this here we also can't make excuses when we are living in black cities with majority yeah. black elected officials and our yeah. school system still being in shambles. And so uh, certainly uh, look forward to that. Uh, your superintendent, uh, I, I met her when I was there uh, a couple of years ago. And so uh, good luck. Yeah, well, thank, thanks, Rowan. I appreciate it. If you're not a member of Join the, uh, the Funk Fan Club, you have got to, roll. And If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be able to have, you know, be as informed as we are to have the messages that we're getting out. And so thank you, your panel, for your integrity, uh, because we are listening. The world is listening, and you mean a lot. Congratulations on the new app. It's already downloaded. All three of my phones got it, so I'm all in. Thank you. Thank I you, thank appreciate you. it. Thank you so very much. Thanks a lot. Folks, uh, it has been uh, a uh, pretty wild 24 hours since we announced uh, the launch of Black Star Network. Uh, folks have been. So what happens is, uh, you know, I get alerts on, on my phone uh, when uh, when every person who uh, who joins. Uh, and so literally I'm sitting here and I'm just scrolling up and I'm just in all these different people uh, are sitting here. Uh, uh, you, you see the announcement uh, of folks uh, who uh, are joining, and we certainly appreciate that. Uh, and so here are the platforms that, that we are on. And so as we said, uh, we are on Apple TV, Android TV, we're on Amazon Fire Stick, Amazon TV. Uh, we are on, uh, again, uh, drop the little, there we go, we are on um, a Samsung Smart TV, Xbox, Roku, all of those platforms downloaded to your phone uh, as well. Uh, you can see the show on the app as well. We still live streaming on YouTube, on F Facebook, uh, on Instagram as well. Then, of course, we have our social media. Uh, uh, we're on all social media platforms. Let's show that, please. You can catch us on uh, Twitter. Uh, catch us on Instagram, uh, Facebook uh, as well. I have not set up the, I think, no, I think we're also on TikTok too. So we're on all of those different platforms. And so, uh, you know, it has been a, a quite the busy uh, 24 hours in uh, hopefully next week, hopefully next week, uh, Terrain, Brittany and Michael, I will then be able to unveil Folks, our uh, studio, when we are complete, we've got it completely uh, done. Our set piece is going to be constructed next week. Green screen is already in here. We're going to finish uh, the set here, hang all the, uh, the black art that we have up in here and all the LED lights. So we got a lot of stuff we got to do. Uh, I am Y'all going to have a great Labor Day weekend. Uh, let's see here. Brittany, what are your plans? That's a great question. Um, just spending some quality <laughs> time with my folks, for real, barbecuing, you know. Chilling. <laughs> I love you. you barbecuing or somebody else barbecuing? Oh, some, some, somebody else's barbecuing. Oh, uh, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> so. Let me enjoy myself. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. All right, Michael? 
Uh, well, Roland, I'm teaching uh, two online classes dealing with history this weekend, one on Saturday dealing with understanding the transatlantic slave trade, and uh, Sunday dealing with history from the end of the Civil War through 1968. So people can visit my website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, for more information. But that's what I'm doing this weekend, and uh, I'm taking Monday off. I'm not doing my radio show Monday, so I'm going to try to get as much sleep as I can because I am sleep deprived. Uh, Terrain, what you doing? Trying to enjoy these last few days of summer, like Brittany catching up with some much-needed barbecue and some family fun and friends. All right. Well, I ain't going no damn where. Uh, I'm playing <laughs> golf this weekend, uh, relaxing. Uh, we don't have a live show on Monday, which is Labor Day, because it's Labor mm -hmm. Day. Uh, but uh, we, we, of course, uh, are going to be—I'll be leaving uh, for Nashville on Tuesday, so I'll be broadcasting— uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered from Nashville on Tuesday. Of course, I'm scholar in residence at Fisk University. I'll be giving my first lecture at Fisk on Wednesday. Uh, and so I'll be broadcasting from there on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, and so look forward to that. And also uh, interacting with uh, the students, faculty, and staff at Fisk and having some of those students. So let me explain to y'all what we do. So uh, I don't play games when it comes to when I go places. I put folks through the paces. And so uh, the students at Fisk will be helping me with the show. And they're going to be learning real time how to actually uh, do production and broadcast a show. And so y'all better get ready because I don't play. Uh, other people, uh, they teach. Oh, we teach, but we teach you for real. Uh, and so we'll look forward to uh, Professor Uncle Roro uh, dropping uh, <laughs> on the campus uh, and just letting y'all know I don't play. Just letting y'all know I'm giving you a heads up. If y'all want to support our Brina Funk fan club, please do so. Every dollar you give goes to support the show. We've had some fantastic support. Uh, man, the last 24 hours, folks, we were giving. Uh, again, every dollar you give goes to support what we do. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. Uh, that's right. Uh, Venmo is forward slash, R, excuse me, at RM Unfiltered. Uh, you have uh, PayPal is uh, R Martin Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. No, uh, we are, we, we have created accounts. Uh, on the other apps for Black Star Network, but if you want to support Black Star Network, you keep giving to these accounts right here. Uh, there is a cash app that is uh, dollar sign Black Star Network. That is not us. That is not us. It was created September 2020. That is not us. So you support, if you want to support this show and Black Star Network, you give to cash app at dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo at RM Unfiltered. Zelle, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at Roland Martin Unfiltered filtered.com uh, uh, and uh, we have let's see here I'm gonna see if I can read this real quick uh, shout out to Tommy Williams Billy Buck uh, Farah Deborah Elaine Corey Jackson Thanisha Daryl Lavelle Kevin Linquist Willie Jackson Jordan McBride Ronald McGee Clarissa Lane Deborah Montgomery Monica George Hamilton Cassandra Galloway James McBride Ned Murray Marquise Reed Sherry Ruffin Tim Roddy Alicia Benjamin uh, let's see here Rob Parlow Michael Addison Barbara Foster Otis Lasky, Landria Jordan, Sharna Washington, Tania Williams, Katura Jones, Angela Wilkerson, Brown Strickland, Alan Brown, Joan Warren, Effie Coley, Michaela Harris, Anthony Lawson, Larnell Farmer, Dana Washington, Corey Brown, Anthony Mosley, Darren McCatney, uh, Darren McCatney again, Curtis Rose, Jay Earl, Robert Brown, Ronald Pierce, uh, Drum Agours, Kenneth, Kenneth Leonard Martin, Deborah Joshua, Otis Parker, Evelyn Wesley, uh, Chancellor Jenkins, Jamel Thomas, Marla. Uh, Darcel Creighton, Courtney Thurman, Shafar Flowers, Wade Legrand, James McBride, Esther, Derek Levette, uh, Tony Briones, uh, Hanua Farid, Katrina Smith, Charles Square, Jeffrey Carter, Bougie, Tina, Carolyn Battle, Barbara Robinson, Hope Cromarty, Joyce Jackson Lott, uh, Azaline Jones, Lorena Hayes, Denise Coleman, uh, B. Nicole, Catherine, Katrina McWashington, Brian Jones, Elena Baltimore, all of y'all who have contributed to the show uh, in uh, the past uh, 72 hours. We always end the show running the list of our uh, members of the Bring It Funk fan club. That's what we got right there. You don't see your name, send us an email, we'll get you on the list. Folks, I'll see y'all on Tuesday. Have a fantastic Labor Day weekend. Mask up, wash your hands, sanitizer. Also, practice social distancing. We want you to stay safe and get your vaccine if you have not. I'll see y'all on Tuesday. I also shout out to Black Brilliance for the t-shirt. I appreciate it. Ho!